let's proceed on to today's message. Today's message may not be palatable to your ears, but it will bring health to your soul if you receive it in all humility. The message you are about to hear this morning is something different from what you have heard before. A very strange title. Seriousness of sinking. Seriousness of sinking. To be very frank with you this morning, I have prepared more than five, six messages this week for this Sunday. But I was not very much led to speak on those messages. And finally, I felt very much urged that I should speak on this subject. You know, it's very difficult for a preacher, you know, to preach a message. It is not just pick up a verse at random, we just share with you something. No, not at all. We need to wait on God for hours together to receive a word and then to prepare that message. You know, it's a tough job, but God is so gracious that week after week, God is feeding us, teaching us His word. Amen. Seriousness of sinking. Let's turn our Bibles this morning to Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 14. Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 14. Let's read from verse 28 down to verse 30. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, when he saw the wind so strong, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Peter cried unto the Lord saying, Lord, save me. Church, for the next few minutes, don't allow your minds to wander. Focus your entire attention on God's word. God wants to speak to you this morning. Peter had a wonderful desire to draw close to the Lord Jesus Christ. To come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we must come out of our boat. How many of you believe? It's not easy. If you want to come close to the Lord, we must be willing to come out of a boat. We must be willing to come out of ourselves. See what always stands for the world. If we want to come closer to the Lord, we must be willing to come out of ourselves and be willing, begin to walk on the things of this world. Walk on the things of this world. Things of the world should be under our feet. Amen. Imagine the best swimmer. He was a seaman. Born and brought up in the sea. An expert fisherman. A best swimmer. Now crying out to God for help. Look at the Bible verse 30. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. All his experience, all his knowledge could not help him. And beginning to sink. And he cried saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, immediately, Lord Jesus stretched forth his hand, caught him and said unto him, Oh, thou of little faith, O oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, praise God, the wind ceased. When both Peter and the Lord Jesus Christ walked back to the ship, the wind ceased. The wind ceased. Amen. And this wind was sent only to teach Peter a lesson. Why did the Lord allow that wind? Because God had a plan to teach Peter a marvelous lesson. Sometimes, dear brother, sister, 
Wind may blow contrary in your life. Your life may become a struggle. But when God allows a boisterous wind in your life and mine, it means God is planning to teach a lesson. God is trying to teach you a lesson. Amen. But the thought that touched my heart was this. Thank God, Peter knew that he was sinking. Peter knew that he was sinking. Because he knew that he was sinking, he could cry out for help. He could cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just imagine, had he not known that he was sinking, he wouldn't have cried out to the Lord and he would have been capsized. He would have been thrown to death. But thank God Peter knew he was sinking. And therefore he could cry out to the Lord for help. And the Lord immediately stretched out his hand, caught him and lifted him up. But today, many believers do not know they are sinking in that spiritual life. I'm talking something very important. Today there are many believers, many people in Christendom. They are sinking in their spiritual life. But they are not aware. They do not know they are sinking in their spiritual life. Church, do you know something? Listen to me, please. The sea and the wind cannot drown a believer. Did you hear me? The sea and the raging wind cannot drown a believer. It's only the unbelief. It's only the doubt. It's only the fears. It's only the distance from you and the Lord in your spiritual life can drown you into the bottom. Are you following me? Am I making sense this morning? Your situation cannot drown you, brother. Your circumstance cannot drown you. It's only your unbelief. It's only a doubt. It's only a fear. It's only your distance from the Lord can drown you. Amen. To the bottom. A person who is alive will know when he's sinking. But a person who is dead, who has no life in him, will not know when he's sinking into the water. Am I right? A person who has life will know that he is sinking. But a person who is dead, think of a dead body. A person who has no life in him will not know when he is sinking. Those who are spiritually dead will not know they are sinking in that spiritual life. What we read about Samson. Samson wished not that the Lord had departed from him. What a tragedy. The Lord had departed from him, but he never knew about it. Today, that's the condition of many people. Many people live in supposition, imagination, assumption that the spiritual life is fine, okay. But in reality, Sorry to say, many, many Christians, believers, even servants of God, spiritual people, are sinking, sinking in their spiritual life. It's a tragedy. If you know that you are sinking in your spiritual life, you're a blessed man, you're a blessed woman. If you know that. If you know that you are sinking in your spiritual life, you're going down in your spiritual life. If you know that, if you are aware of that, I tell you, you are a blessed person. Now, just before this incident, what we read this morning, the disciples had witnessed a great miracle upon the mountain with the Lord Jesus Christ. They had watched in amazement as the Lord Jesus Christ took the five loaves and two fishes, looked up and blessed it and distributed it. To 5,000 men beside women and children. And verse 22 tells us, And straight away, after the greatest miracle of the Lord Jesus feeding the multitude, in verse 22 we read, 
the Lord Jesus Christ constrained them. Straight away constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him unto the other side while he sent away the multitude. Every word is important. After a very great miracle of feeding the multitude, the Lord Jesus Christ sent away the multitude and he constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go on to the other side. Amen. It was on the Sea of Galilee that the Lord Jesus Christ would teach this wonderful lesson of faith to the disciples. Now, they had seen a very great miracle. Now, they were about to face a very great test. After experiencing a very great miracle, now they are about to face a time of terrible tests. Friend, this seems to be the reality in our Christian life. After we experience some, some of the greatest blessings in our lives, the Lord always allows us, you know, some of the most trying situations in our life. You know why? Adversary is God's university. Never forget, adversity that you face in your life is what? Is God's university. University. It is during the most severe trials of life that we learn more of God than at, than at, at any other time. Are you going through a tough time? It's during the most severe trials of life that we learn more of God than at any other time. If you say this morning, Pastor, I'm going through trials, I'm going through difficulties, I tell you, you're knowing the Lord in a better way than ever before. Amen. Lord Jesus constrained them to go before him on the other side while he sent away the multitude. Friend, multitudes are different from disciples. The lesson is only for the disciples, not for the multitude. Even today, teaching of God's word is not for everybody. It's not for the multitude. It's not for a big crowd. It's for the chosen few. It's for the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says the Lord Jesus Christ went alone to a mountain apart to pray. And while he was praying there up the mountain... The disciples down facing one of the most fierce tests of the faith. And they were all out in the sea. And the sea being tossed to and fro by the waves. For the wind was contrary, the Bible says. And I truly believe, <clears throat> while the disciples were facing the storm, the Lord Jesus Christ on the top of the mountain, praying for them. Interceding for them. That's what even happens today. When you are going through trials and difficulties, we have an intercessor. We have an high priest who intercedes for you and me. How many of you believe that? That's what the author to the Hebrews says. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. Don't worry if other people don't pray for you. The Lord Jesus Christ is interceding for you. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth. Why? Why does the Lord Jesus live today? To make intercession for them. To make intercession for them. While the disciples facing a fierce storm and raging sea out, there in the middle of the ocean, the Lord Jesus Christ was on the top of the mountain interceding for them. Then you know what happened? The Lord Jesus Christ came walking to them on the sea, on the water, in the fourth watch of the night, somewhere between 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., fourth watch. The Lord Jesus Christ came walking on the water toward the disciples. In the fourth watch, between 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., it was at dark. 
And the Bible says they were so afraid, supposing him to be a spirit. But Jesus spoke to them and said, Be of good cheer, it is high. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. It's high. Be of good cheer, it is high. Verse 27. And they weren't convinced until Peter opened his mouth and said, Lord, if it is you, let me come to you on the water. Lord, if it is you, if it is you, let me come to you on the water. What did the Lord Jesus say? Come. And Peter began to walk on the water, coming closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and he started to sink. Thank God Peter knew he was sinking. And he cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, save me. Something amazed me. He was a fisherman, a very best swimmer. Could have Peter used his expertise to swim and save his life? He couldn't. His natural abilities failed. All his experiences failed. He lost hope in his own strength. He felt in that situation he cannot swim and save himself. He was in a terrible predicament. And that was the time he cried unto Jesus saying, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Friend, many a time we are like Peter. We have faith. We have a desire to come close to Lord Jesus Christ. We even trust the Lord. We trust Him and have to get out of a boat and start walking toward Jesus. But then, contrary wind begins to blow. Contrary wind begins to blow in your life and you start to sink. How many of you have gone through that experience? You have a desire to come close to God. You have a desire to pray more. You have a desire to worship God. You have a desire to spend time with God's word. You even trust God to come out of your boat, to come out of your cell. And walk toward Jesus. But by then, contrary wind blows against you. And you start to sink. You get discouraged. You get depressed. You get downhearted. You become gloomy. Friend, God is speaking to you. In this event, we see four things. The power of the Savior. Number two, the problem of the storm. Number three, the performance of the saints. Number four, the peril of sinking. But I'm not going to preach on these thoughts sometime later. But I want you to think today, this morning, seriousness of sinking. Seriousness of sinking. When we are sinking in our spiritual life, friend, we must know it. Otherwise, we are in danger. If you go low in your spiritual life, if you feel that you're going away from God, if you feel that God's presence is leaving you, you must know it. You must know it. Having known it, we must cry unto Him, Lord, help me, help me. Just think of this, brother, sister. If you're sick, what do you do? Run to a doctor. If you lose your appetite, what do you do? Run to a doctor. There are so many worried, am I right? But unfortunately, many Christians, they lose their spiritual appetite. They become spiritually sick. The soul becomes sick and they are least bothered about it. In fact, they don't know they are sinking in their spiritual life. I know God is speaking to you today. When you are sinking, when you get low in your spiritual life, you must know it and you must cry unto the Lord. What did Peter say? Lord, save me. Save me. Amen. If you don't know you are sinking, 
If you don't know you are away from the Lord, if you don't know you are becoming cold in your spiritual life, friend, I tell you, you are in a terrible danger. When can we know that we are sinking? That's my message this morning. When can you know? When can I know? When we are sinking, when we are going low. I want to share with you five thoughts this morning. Do you know when you'll be sinking? Number one. When Calvary doesn't break you. Friend, you are spiritually sinking when Calvary's cross doesn't break you any longer. Number two, we know we are sinking when sin doesn't bother us. When sin doesn't bother us. Number three, we know we are sinking. When the presence of the Savior doesn't bless us. Very important thoughts. Number four. We know we are sinking when Satan doesn't battle us. When Satan doesn't battle us. Number five. We know we are sinking when sinner doesn't burden us. When you see a sinner, you are not burdened in your heart. It means you are sinking in your spiritual life. Allow the Spirit of God to minister to you this morning. How can He know that you are sinking? How can He know that you are sinking? How can He know that you are becoming spiritually cold? How can He know when you don't feel the presence of the Lord? How can He know that you are going away from God when Calvary's cross does not break you. That's a very clear indication in your life that you are spiritually sinking, my brother, my sister. Turn your Bible this morning to Luke's Gospel, chapter 23 and verse 33. Luke's Gospel, chapter 23 and verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. There they crucified him. If they had only known that he, says that he was the Savior, and he only had they only known that he was the Messiah, they wouldn't have crucified him. They didn't know. They didn't know that the Lord was the Savior, that the Lord was the Messiah. When they came to a place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. Church, now listen to me please. We know we are sinking when we can sing of Calvary, think of Calvary, speak of Calvary without a teardrop coming out of our eyes. Are you listening? When you sing of Calvary, when you think of Calvary, when you speak of Calvary, if tear drops, if they don't come out of your eyes, friend, I tell you, you are spiritually sinking. Do you know something? Nobody can come to Calvary's cross and walk away neutral. Amen. Either you have to be broken or you have to harden your heart. But you cannot walk away neutral. How many of you have this experience? How many of you, you know, have this experience when you think of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary? How many of you feel that your heart is broken? How many of you shed tears till today? Hallelujah. How many of you can say, yes, what the Lord did for me melts my heart every time I think of Calvary's cross? Amen. Amy Carmichael said once like this. There is something in the Calvary that passes all human understanding. And the words about the precious blood of Jesus should never be read or sung except on the knees of our spirit and tears on our eyes. Is that your experience, brother? Sister, is that your experience? There is something 
in the Calvary that passeth all human understanding. And the words about the precious blood of Jesus should never be read, should never be sung except on the knees of our spirit and tears on our eyes. If the Calvary's cross doesn't break your heart, friend, I tell you, as a man of God, you are sinking in your spiritual life. How many of you know God is speaking? I cannot forget one incident which happened years ago, way back in 1980s. I was in my college at the time. I remember one Sunday morning in our main church, when our beloved late Pastor G. Sundaram was alive. I remember even today, it was a Holy Communion Sunday. A song was sung on Calvary's cross. And the people, congregation, were clapping their hands and singing that song. It was on Calvary's cross. I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, pastor stood up and he was so angry. And he shouted at the congregation. It's still, I remember, it's like a fresh paint in my memory. He stood up and he shouted at the congregation and said, What are you doing? Please stop it. Please stop it. How can you clap your hands for a Calvary song? This song, this is a song that you sh should sing with tears, not with the hands clapping. I learned a very big lesson. Oh, I never knew that before. Probably I was also one of them clapping my hands. But that man of God said, how can you clap your hands and sing a song on Calvary? It should bring tears to your eyes. It should melt your heart. It should break your heart. That day, we learned a very big lesson. Very big lesson. Church, if Calvary doesn't break us, there's something wrong in your spiritual life. Probably you're sinking in your spiritual life. When it comes to Calvary's cross, we must have three experiences. Number one, we must see the vision of the cross. We must hear the voice of the cross. We must experience the victory of the cross. Did you hear me? I'm talking something very important. When it comes to Calvary's cross, you must see the vision of Calvary. You must hear the voice of Calvary. You must hear the victory of Calvary. That's the experience of every true believer. What do I mean when I say vision of the cross? Turn your Bible to Galatians chapter 6 verse 14. Galatians chapter 6 verse 14. What does Apostle Paul say when he wrote to the church at Galatia? Galatians chapter 6 verse 14 but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he says, I will take glory only in the cross by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Praise God. Praise God. Read that verse again. But God forbid that I should glory in anything else other than the cross of Calvary of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Friend, do you have that vision? What does the Bible say in Proverbs 29, 18? Need not turn your Bibles. Where there is no vision? Come on. People, perish. If you don't have the vision of the cross of Calvary, if you don't see what the Lord Jesus had done for you to save you, to redeem you. Amen. Friend, we will sink in our spiritual life. Think of the word perish. Where there is no vision, 
people perish. The Hebrew word for perish is ipara. It means to go back, to backslide. If you don't have the vision of the cross of Calvary, friend, I tell you, sooner or later, you will backslide in your Christian life. For the English word perish, the Hebrew word used ipara. That means to go back. Unless our faith is strong in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will go back instead of going forward. What is the problem with Peter? Peter was doing fine until he got his eyes off the Lord. He was fine until he got his eyes off the Lord. Fixed his eyes on his problems. Fixed his eyes on the boisterous wind. Fixed his eyes on his situation and circumstance. When he took his eyes off the Lord and fixed his eyes on the problem, it is then he stopped moving forward and started to go down. What about you this morning? Friend, when we get the eyes off the Lord and the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, then we begin to sink. Then we begin to go back. Amen. What does the writer of the Hebrews say? Turn about the Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 2 and 3. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 2 and 3. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of a faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What was the joy set before him? The bride, his bride, the church. Amen. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. So what should we do? Verse 3. Consider him. Think of him. Acknowledge him. Consider Jesus who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in your mind. Now I tell you, listen to me please. We all have a measure of own problem, am I right? Nobody is exempted from trials and difficulties. You have a different problem, I have a different problem. Nobody is exempted. But as we go through trials, if you take your eyes off the Lord, friend, you will become weary. You will become faint hearted. You will become depressed. But if you fix your eyes on the Lord Jesus as you go through trials and difficulties, you can come out of it victoriously. That's the secret. That's why right in the Hebrew says, For consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Otherwise, you will become weary and faint in your mind. Friend, if you lose the vision of the cross, you will begin to sink in your spiritual life. Secondly, I told you, voice of Calvary, isn't it? We must hear the voice of Calvary. What does Apostle Paul say? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. 1 Corinthians, voice of Calvary. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, Lest the cross of Christ should be made none effect. See what it says. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish. What is it? Foolishness. For the people who perish, preaching of the cross sounds foolish. But unto us which are saved, come on. It is the power of God. For you and me, Preaching of the cross of Christ is the power of God that can transform our lives from inside out. Amen. Now I want to ask you this morning, what does, what does Calvary voice speak? What does Calvary voice speak? Two things. Make a note of it. Every time you meditate on Calvary's cross, it speaks of two things. Number one, forgiveness of sin. Number two, Freedom from sin. Don't forget, God is speaking to you. Every time you think of Calvary's cross, 
It speaks of two things. What is number one? Forgiveness of sin. What is number two? Freedom from sin. Forgiveness of sin. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Forgiveness of sin. Now forgive, forgiveness of sin through what? Through the blood. Through the blood. Forgiveness of sin through what? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. What's number two? Freedom from sin. Freedom from sin is through the word of God. Forgiveness of sin through the blood. Freedom from sin is through the word of God. Word of, you shall know the truth. Come on. And the truth shall set you free. Don't forget. Your forgiveness of your sin comes from. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. But freedom from sin. From the word. From the word. From the truth. Now listen. 99% of Christians today. They live only. In the first experience. What is that? Forgiveness of sin. Are you listening by the way? 99% of believers today. Living only. In the first level. Forgiveness of sin. They commit a sin. Convicted in the heart. Run to the Lord. Lord. I have committed sin against you. Forgive me God. God forgives them in, a, in his mercy. Go back. Commit the same old sin. Come back to God. Lord forgive me. I have sinned against you. God forgives again. Again we commit sin. Come to God. Ask for forgiveness. Friend how long? How long? How long you are going to be in that experience? There is a second experience. What's that? Freedom from sin. God is calling the church today to the second experience where you and I will be set free from sin. Thank God in forgiveness we are delivered from the penalty of sin. But in the freedom of sin God delivers you and me from the power of sin. And that's where we are sanctified. We are sanctified. If you are growing in the Lord Asking forgiveness will decrease in your life. If you have the freedom from sin, you need not go again and again and again and again and stand before God and feel guilty and say, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. Friend, how long are we going to seek forgiveness? That's not God's plan. That's only an initial experience. But as we grow, God is calling us for what? Freedom from sin. Somebody say freedom from sin. Freedom from sin. Now forgiveness comes through what? Blood. Freedom from sin comes through? Word. Now how many of you understand the importance of God's word? How many of you understand the importance of Bible study? Sorry to say, many people don't understand. Friend, I tell you, unless God's word goes deep in your spirit, you can never be freed from the nature of sin. You will be committing sin and going asking God for forgiveness. Committing sin, asking forgiveness. Committing sin, how long, how long, how long, how long? That's not Christian life. Forgiveness of sin happens in the outer court. Freedom from sin happens in the holy place. Where we have the menorah, when we have the table of showbread, where we have the altar of incense, it all stands for the word of God. How many of you long for the freedom of sin? Lord, I've been asking forgiveness for many years, for many years in my life, God. But I need freedom from sin. What does the Bible say? Sin shall not have dominion over you. Somebody shout amen. amen. Friend, sin shall not have power over you. Sin shall not have dominion over you. It happens only through the word of God. Amen. The more you listen to God's word, the more you apply God's word to your life.
The more you allow the word to sink and settle deep down in your spirit, you are set free from the nature of sin. Only from there, you begin to resemble Christ. Only from there, your life begins to change. Your life begins to, Have you seen some Christians, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years Christians, but nature not completely changed? The very same old nature, the same old fighting, the same old corrupt communication. After so many years of being a Christian, absolutely no change in the life. What is the reason? They are still in the outer court. They are still seeking only forgiveness through the blood and not freedom through the word. How many of you know God is speaking? What did Jesus say? Turn about to John's gospel chapter 15. Very important verse. Mark it in the Bible. John's gospel chapter 15. Verse 3. Now we are clean. Now we are clean. Through the word which I have spoken to you. Which I have spoken to you through the word that I have spoken. Friend, every time you come into God's presence and listen to the word of God, something happens within you. You are cleansed. Your nature changes. Your life changes. You get the freedom from the nature of sin. Aspire. Desire. Long for the freedom from sin. Freedom from sin. Whom the Son sets free, he shall be free indeed. Who is the Son? He is the truth. And that's the Bible says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Praise God. I told you about the vision of Calvary. I told you about the voice of Calvary. One more. What's that? Victory of Calvary. John Gospel chapter 19. John's Gospel chapter 19 and verse 30. John's Gospel chapter 19 and verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, come on. It is finished. The work of redemption is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. I call this victory, victory of Calvary. Do you know something, friend? At Calvary, sin received its mortal blow. Sin received its mortal wound. There the victim became a victor. It's true, Jesus fell, but crushed the enemy in the fall. It seems as if, you know, Jesus falling, but in his fall, he crushed the enemy's head. He died, but the sin was nailed to the cross. His cross becomes the fountain of our life and his tomb becomes the birthplace of our immortality. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm excited. How many of you? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Friend at the cross of Calvary, it is threefold victory. Victory over death, victory over devil, and victory over sin. Threefold victory at the foot of the cross of Calvary. Victory over death, Victory over devil. Victory over sin. Amen. I don't have time to show you the verses. But just you search it out in the Bible. Victory over death. Amen. Hallelujah. The death is swallowed up in victory. Oh death, where is thy saying? Oh grave, where is thy victory? For the death is swallowed up in victory. Because Jesus Christ overcame death through death so that you and I can overcome death in our life. You need not fear death anymore. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And God has given us victory over the enemy, the devil. And God has given us victory over sin. Amen. Sin. The Bible says once we were dead in trespasses and sin, we were like sheep without a shepherd. But Jesus Christ redeemed us from our sin. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The thought I like to drive in your heart this morning. When you think of Calvary, it should break our hearts. It should convict us of our sinful condition. Its love should melt our hearts. 
friend, if it doesn't, if Calvary doesn't break you, it's an indication you're sinking in your spiritual life. Is it clear? Have I made it clear to you this morning? Number two. When can we know we are sinking? When sin doesn't bother you. When sin doesn't bother us. Turn your Bible to Ephesians. Chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Is your sin bothering you by the way? It's a good indication. You are healthy. Is your sin worrying you? Are you worried about the sin you have been committing again and again? It should happen. It should happen. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1. Be therefore followers of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named among you, named among you as becoming as become of saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, dirty jokes, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no warmonger, nor unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater, at any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God, let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For he was sometimes darkness, but now you are in the light of the Lord. Walk as children of light. Hallelujah. Church, listen to me, please. There are some believers, some Christians, even some servants of God. They know they are sinning against God. They know it. They know there is sin in their lives. But they are not bothered about it at all. Absolutely no worry. It's like having a serpent in your home and still not worried about it. Is it possible? Think there's a serpent, there's a snake coming to home and you're not worried about it. Is it possible? No, absolutely not. The Lord said to Cain, Cain, be careful, sin lieth at the door. Sin lieth at the threshold. Be careful, it's like a snake, it's like a serpent. You're coming out, you're going in, but you don't know a serpent is lying at the threshold of your home. You don't worry about the sin at the door. One day, it will kill you. The same snake, the same sin that have been coming again. And now it's fun, brother. But a day will come. It will no longer be fun. That will be terrible. I can never forget a story which my Sunday school teacher taught me while I was a kid. You know what was it? Have you heard about snake charmer? Snake charmer. Amen. They used to have a snake and they put a show in a public street in a crowded place. There was a man who was putting a show with a great python on his shoulders. A very big python. You know, the, that big python will strangle him, entangle him and he will pretend as if he's dying and people will be watching around and finally, you know, he will, you know, move out his face and he will relieve himself from that python and people will applaud and clap their hands and enjoy this. You know what happened one day? That python was literally strangling him. Doing it really. And his bones were breaking. People thought he's making fun. No one came to his aid. This man was dying. All his bones within breaking. The python was literally strangling him. Entangled him. Coiled him. Finally, that man fell down dead. Only then people realized, oh, it happened really. This man has been doing it for many months and years, putting a show, but today it has happened in his real life. 
Friend, that is what sin can do in your life. Initially it is fun. But don't forget. A day, if you are ne- if you are negligent, if you are not careful, if you are going to play with sin, it's going to kill you one day. Does sin bother you, brother? As I told you earlier, if there is any sickness in our body, we are so worried. Many people come to me, Pastor, I have constant headache, I have migraine headache, please pray for me. But I've never seen even one person coming to me and saying, Pastor, I want to get victory over my sin. I want to get victory over my bad temper. No, not one. Not one. We are worried only about the physical things. Not worried, least bothered about our spiritual life. Not bothered about our holiness. Friend, we need to be bothered about three things. Number one, the language of the world. Number two, the leaders of the world. Number three, the learning of the world. Think about it. We must be worried about the language of the world. What is the language of the world today? Terrible, terrible. Corrupt communication. Speaking out only lies. Making fun of spiritual things. Charles Spurgeon once said like this. Whenever I hear a man swear, I always want to pray for him. It is horrible thing that men should blaspheme, curse and swear. But I believe there would be less of these evil if Christians pray to the Lord for them and for their deliverance. What is the language of the world today? Terrible. Corrupt communication. The moment they open their mouth, filth. Speaking only lies. Making fun of God and making fun of spiritual things. It should bother you, friend. The language of the world should bother you. Should drive you into God's presence and say, Lord, change these people. Change the language of the world. The leaders of the world should bother us. There's never been a time in which there is more corruption today. Come on, are you with me? In our society, in public, and the world leaders as it is today. Can I tell you something? One of the biggest, you know, problem, one of the biggest problem in India today one of India's biggest problem is not simply bad people doing wrong, but good people doing nothing. This is a problem. Bad people will do wrong. It's very natural. It's very common. But what good people are doing? They are doing nothing. I used to cry in presence of God and say, Lord, there are so many bad people doing things, but what good people are doing? What are we doing? One of the greatest problems today, it's not bad people who do wrong, but good people who do nothing. Friend, God has called you and me to do something about it. What can you and I do? Only pray unto the Lord. Hallelujah. The most dangerous fault in Indian life today is lack of interest in the truth. Even among believers, no interest in God's word. Can I tell you something? If I say today evening we have a miracle service, we have a healing service, I challenge you, I guarantee you will be here this evening. But if I say we have a Bible study, oh, Bible study. Friend, you are in trouble, you are sinking. You don't know, you are sinking in your spiritual life. Be careful, don't continue in that lifestyle. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. What does the Bible say? Pray for the authorities. Amen. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, we don't have time to read. 1 Timothy chapter 2, make a note of it. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all those who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in godliness and honesty. Amen. Think of the learning of the world. Learning of the world. What do people learn today in the world? Terrible. Terrible. Friends, you know what Paul says with the exhorted in Timothy, turn your Bible please. This is what people are taught in the world today. Now do you understand how important it is to come to God's house and to be taught in the word of God? 
Because something else is taught in the world. Something else is taught outside the church. Terrible things. Terrible things. If you are influenced by the learning of the world. Friend, you are in trouble. That's the reason it's very important for God's people. To come into the church and learn God's word. See what Paul says. Learning of the world. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Follow me. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Reading from verse 1. This know also that in the last days, perilous time shall come, for men shall be, shall be read together. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despises of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, for learning, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Ever learning. So many things are taught in this world. People are ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth of God. Friend, I tell you, you can never learn the truth of the knowledge of God in the world. It's only the church of the living God. Hallelujah. If you attend any place of higher learning today, you will see a definite antichrist bias. I tell you, this is the truth. Anywhere you go in the world and learn, try to learn something, you will see a definite anti-Christian bias. Even in the universities and the colleges, which were started by Christians. Amen. Can you just imagine Christians right from the inception? It's been infiltrated by the devil today. Years ago, I'm talking about 1980s, my wife and I, we once visited Sarampur University in West Bengal. A very famous university, Sarampur University. Beautiful campus. It was founded by William Carey, a very godly man. He was a man who translated Bible into most of our Indian languages. Initially, it was started as a Bible college. Sarampur University was started as a Bible college. But you know what happened? Hindus have taken up that management and they, and they started a secular college in that and today, unfortunately, the old Sarampur University is closed now. Such a big campus. Acres of land. Dear God's people, we are living in a terrible world. As you know, even in corporate companies, corporate com companies, they promote LGBT today. Come on, are you with me? Let's be very practical. Terrible. Friend, we are living in a terrible time. Terrible time. Unless we come into God's presence and learn of the truth, of the knowledge of God, we are in trouble. We are in trouble. Ask a question to yourself. Does sin bother you? Does sin bother you? When you are living in a sin, friend, I tell you, I tell you, You would have probably given up so many sins in your life. But there will be one sin, one sin. Darling sin. Sin which does so easily beset you. That will always remain close to you. There is a struggle with that one sin in your life. God is talking about that one sin. You may say, Lord, I've given up all these things. I've given up that. I've given up this. Yes. But one sin, brother. Sister, that one sin which you had before. Is still today in your life. That one sin so easily beset you. It's so very close to you. Bible says set aside that one sin that so easily beset you. Does it bother you? You have been falling in that one sin again and again. Have you ever tried to go into God's presence and say Lord. Let me go on a fast. And pray that you will strengthen my inner man. So that I can get rid of that one sin. Have you ever done that, brother? 
Sister, today there are many Christians who fast for the problems. But there are very few. Number, we can just count on, count them. Very few, one or two, who fast for holiness. How many of you fast for holiness? How many of you fast for that one sin, you know, so that you will get rid of it? Get rid of it. I'm asking you this morning, does sin bother you? If it doesn't bother you, it means you're sinking spiritually. Sinking spiritually. Don't neglect, brother. God is speaking to you. God is interested in your holiness. God is interested in your character development. God is interested, you know, in your life-changing process. It happens through the power, anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Does sin bother you? Ask a question to yourself. Ask a question to yourself. Am I really worried about that one sin which I've been falling again and again and again for many years now? If not us, God and say, Lord, make me sensitive, Lord. Give me that conviction, Lord, so that from today, I will take it very seriously, radically deal with it. And I will give up. Get rid of it. At any cost. Friend, hallelujah, the Lord wants to stretch forth this helping hand and lift you up. Lift you up from that one sin that's been haunting you for years now. If God is speaking to you, do not harden your heart. Number three, we know we are sinking when the presence of the Savior doesn't bless us. It's a very important thought. God's presence is there, but you're not blessed. What is the reason? In the presence of the Lord, if you are not blessed, that means your spiritual life is not okay. It means you've gone far away. I want you to think for a moment. We all come together for a Sunday morning worship. We all worship God. God's presence is very much here. Absolutely no doubt about it. Why, why do some people feel God's presence? Why not others? Why some are blessed in a Sunday morning service? Why not others? Many people who come to church, they go as they have come. Absolutely no change. They just go away from the church as if they had come in. But there are few who lead the church differently. There are few who say today, God spoke to me. There are few who say, I felt the mighty anointing of God. I felt the touch of God. I know something has happened. You're a blessed man. You're a blessed woman. Having come into God's presence, if you're going the same way you came in, friend, I tell you, you're spiritually sinking in your life. You need to get right and set right with God. Come on, are you with me? Don't get offended. Truth always hurts, but it heals. I believe it with all my heart. Amen. Think of the church at Ephesus. Turn about to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Seven stars means seven ministers of God. Pastors of the seven churches. Who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Who walketh in the midst of golden candlestick means churches. Who walketh in the midst of the churches. The Lord says, I know thy work, thy labor, thy patience. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which they say they are apostles and are not. And has formed them liars and has borne and has patience and by my name's sake. You have labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast not lost thy first love, you have left it. If you have lost somewhere, you have lost something somewhere, you will not know where it is. But if you have left something, you know where it is. Am I right? You have left the first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. And repent and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly. And I will remove her. I will remove her. I will not remove you brother. The Lord says I will not remove you sister. But I will remove her. What is a candlestick? I will remove the church from you. It's talking about the rapture. 
Amen. A time will come if you are not prepared, if you are not serious about your spiritual life, God will come and remove your church from you. Your church will be removed. A day is coming. The church shall be caught up and some people will be left behind. Amen. I will come unto thee quickly and I will remove the church out of its place except thou repent. Except thou repent. The presence of God is very much in the church. For what? For what? Do you know for what? Not only to bless you, not only to strengthen you, but also to sanctify you, to correct you, amen, to change you, to transform you. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I want you to think for a moment. The Ark of the Covenant was in the house of Aminadab for how many years? For 20 years. The Ark of the Covenant, which is a type of the presence of the Lord, was in the house of Aminadab for 20 long years. But was his house blessed? Come on. Was his house blessed? No. No. 20 years, this family, they have the Ark of the Covenant in their home. But the house is not blessed. On the other hand, the same Ark of the Covenant was in the house of Obedidim for how many months? Just three months. Just three months. That house was abundantly blessed. The news went abroad and everyone knew in the land of Israel that this home is blessed because of the Ark of the Covenant. Friend, what is the difference? What is it? Look, look in the Bibles. Turn the Bible to 2 Samuel. Chapter 6. Second Samuel. Chapter 6. And verse 3. Look at the Bible please. God is speaking to you. Second Samuel chapter 6 and verse 3. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab. So first of all, the ark was in the house of Abinadab for 20 long years. Nothing happened. House was not blessed. Now see verse 11. Verse 11. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obedidim, the Gittite, three months. Finish it. The Lord blessed Obedidim and all his household. Friend, there's a possibility that God's presence is with you, but you're not blessed. God's presence is in your family, but your family is not blessed. God's presence is with you in your workplace, but you're not blessed. Something is happening. Now what happened? Why Abinadab house was not blessed? Why Hobadidam house was blessed? The secret is, something happened between this. Something happened between the house of Abinadab and house of Obedidim. What happened? David was bringing the ark of God. Listen to me very carefully. David, the king of Israel, was bringing the ark of God from the house of Abinadab to Jerusalem. To the city of God. But they made a mistake. They should have carried the ark of God on the shoulders of the priests and the Levites. Nobody can touch the ark of God. It's so holy. They should have two poles on either side and the Levites, they have to bat it on the shoulders. But this is where they made a mistake. They had a good desire to bring the ark of God to Jerusalem, but they adopted wrong methods. And as they were bringing the ark of the covenant to Jerusalem, the Bible says they brought in a new cart and the oxen stumbled at the threshing floor. The oxen stumbled. Because the oxen stumbled, the son of Abinadab, who was he? Usa. Usa. He touched the Ark of the Covenant. God stuck him down. Look at the Bibles. Where is it? Verse 7, verse 7. Second Samuel, chapter 6, verse 7. Let's read verse 6 also. And when they came to Nagon's threshing floor, 
Musa put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen shook it and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Musa and God smote him there for his error and there he died by the ark of God. Now when this incident happened, the fear of God gripped their hearts. Fear of God gripped their hearts. Either two, there was no fear of God at all. They took the ark of God for granted. They took the ark of God very casually. But from now, from now on, from this moment on, they were gripped with the fear of God. You know what David said? Oh my goodness, I'm not going to take this ark to Jerusalem. Anytime I may be stuck down. So let me keep this ark where? In the house of Obadina. Praise God, he accepted the ark. If he had just said like David, Oh no, I don't want the ark of God. Probably God will even strike me. No, but that man was ready. That man was ready. Hallelujah. To, hallelujah. To have the presence of God in his home. From then on, they had the fear of God. Just now imagine church. The ark of God was in the house of Abinadab. All would have gone to the ark, touched it even. They would have even probably sat on it. Amen. Absolutely no fear of God. But when this incident happened, they were gripped with the fear of God. Now just imagine how the house of Obedidim would have treated the ark of God. Everyday fear. Oh, God's presence is here. God's presence is here. I, I need to be careful. I need to be holy. My home needs to be holy. Friend, that fear of God brought abundant blessing upon the house. Hallelujah. Today I won't say that you don't have the presence of God. You do have the presence of God. Because you pray, you read the Bible. You worship God. Your family, they love the Lord. God's presence is there. But just because there is no fear of God. Friend, there is no fear of God in your home. There is no fear. Sorry to say, even some believers, even after they come to church, no fear of God. Very casual attitude. Very casual. Friend, your life cannot be blessed. We need to have the old-fashioned revival of the fear of God in our lives today. Amen. Sorry to say, people have lost the fear of God. They fear men more than God. Today, people fear people. People fear man more than God. Bible says, fear of man is a snare unto you. Snare unto you. If you fear God, you need not fear any man. Somebody say man. Hallelujah. Because of the fear of God in the house of Obedidam, that house was abundantly blessed. Not only God blessed Obedidam, God blessed his household. And the whole land of Israel came to know that this one home was abundantly blessed. When David heard the house of Obedidam blessed, he came again and fetched the ark of God in the city of Jerusalem. But this time in a totally different way. Hallelujah. How many of you know God is speaking? My time is up this morning. God willing, we'll continue the same message next Sunday morning. But, presence of the Savior, if it doesn't bless you, it means you're spiritually sinking. That it means you're low in your spiritual life. There's something wrong in your spiritual life. Friend, I'm not saying this to bring, put guilt in you or to, to bring condemnation. No. You know, the reason, the reason I'm, Teaching God's word today is so that you will rectify your life. You will once again have the fear of God in your life so that you and your household shall be abundantly blessed. Hallelujah. Why don't we stand up to feed this morning? Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We praise you, God. Every eye close. Every eye close. Thank you, Lord. Even if it's on the ground floor, wherever you are, God's presence is here. God's presence is here. If Calvary doesn't break you, if Calvary doesn't break you, it means you are sinking spiritually. If sin in your life doesn't bother you, if sin in your life doesn't bother you, you are sinking spiritually. If the presence of the Savior doesn't bless you, it means there is something wrong in your spiritual life. Analyze it. Examine it. 
retrospect it. Check your life. God wants to bless you. Brother, God wants to bless you. God desires to bless Israel. God desires to bless you and your home abundantly. But if there is any hindrance for God's blessing, brother, is there any hindrance for God's blessing? Young man, young woman, is there is any hindrance in your life that God's presence not blessing you unless you remove that hindrance? I tell you as God's spokesman today, you can never be blessed. God is waiting for you to remove that hindrance, that hurdle, that barrier, that obstacle and say, Lord, I will not allow anything to come between me and you. I renew my fellowship with you, God. I restore my fellowship with you, God. I set right my relationship with you, Lord. I want to be a person wo void. Lord, I want to be a man, woman of pure conscience, void of offense. If your own conscience condemning you, if your own conscience pricking you, turn to the Lord today. Turn to the Lord today. Thank God Peter knew he was sinking. Because he knew he was sinking, he cried unto Jesus, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. The moment the Lord Jesus heard Peter's Painters cry. Jesus stretched out his hand. Caught him. How many of you want the Lord to catch you today? The Lord caught him. Lifted him up. Made him to walk on the same water where he was sinking. Friend, in the same place where he was sinking, God can lift you up and make you to walk successfully and bring you back to the boat where you were. Hallelujah. When God does it, your wind will cease. When God does it, your wind will cease. Till then, wind will continue to blow. As a servant of God, I have to tell you the truth. Is the wind blowing against you, brother? Sister, do you feel wind is contrary? You're trying to move forward. But not able because the wind is so strong blowing against you. Wind is blowing against you. Do you want God to change the direction of the wind? Do you want the God to change the direction of the wind so that wind will blow behind you and push you forward and enable you to walk, make progress? You got to cry out to the Lord. Cry out to the Lord. Friend, a time will come. Your experience will not come to your aid. Your strength will not come to your help. Your intelligence, your knowledge will not help you. You got to cry out to your maker. You got to cry out to your Lord. How many of you can cry out to the Lord today? Say, Lord, I need help. I need help. I'm not able. I'm not able to make progress. My life is stagnant, Lord. My life is stagnant. Not able to move forward. Not able to come backward. I'm entangled in the middle of it. My life is stagnant. No progress. Nothing is happening. I don't know, I don't know what's happening in my life. I've tried everything, Lord, but everything failed. I've tried everything, but everything failed. Help me. Lord, save me. How many of you can cry out to God today? Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. I feel the awesome presence of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Cry out to God, brother. Cry out to God. Let Calvary become real to you. 
Let Calvary's cross break your heart. Think what Jesus did for you on the cross. Shone of all his glory, became a man of sorrow. Just for you, just for me. Amen. Suffered such ignominious death. Humiliated to the core. Hung between heaven and earth. It's all for you and me. If you want to grow in your spiritual life, Calvary should break your heart. Your sin should bother you. The presence of the Savior should bless you, brother. Should bless you. Every time you come into God's house, you must be blessed. If that's not happening, something wrong. Something wrong. Something wrong. If you continue, if you still neglect, if you still take your spiritual life for granted, you're heading to a trouble. You're heading to a trouble. God knows how to bring you back. God has 101 ways and means, friend, in your life to bring you closer to Him. You can try to run away, but God in His love will run after you. Thank you, Jesus. Because you're called, you're chosen. The Lord says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. How many of you can say, Lord, help me? Cry out, cry out, open your mouth and cry out to the Lord. No matter whatever your situations are, no matter whatever your circumstances are, God is willing to stretch out His helping hand and lift you up, provided you cry out to the Lord. If you remain silent, God will also remain silent. But if you cry out, Hallelujah, God will come to your aid in a way, Hallelujah, not experienced before. I tell you, in the problem where you are in today, no man can help you. You yourself cannot help you. Amen, it's only God, it's only God who can help you, brother. It's only God who can help you, sister. Cry out. Cry out to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Are you shackled by a heavy burden? Are you need, are you beneath the need of guilt and shame? The hand of Jesus wants to touch you. The hand of Jesus wants to touch you. Friend, are you shackled by a heavy burden? Are you, hallelujah, underneath the Lord of guilt and shame? The Lord Jesus wants to touch you and lift you up. Cry unto the Lord in your heart. Lord, I know only you can help me. Nobody can help me, Lord. No man can help me. I'm in a position I cannot help myself. Nothing in this world can help me. I know, I know, I know. My help can come only from above. As David says, My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. My help will not come from man. My help will come from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Thank you, Jesus. Shackled by a heavy burden. Shackled by a heavy burden.
Since I met my blessed Savior, since I met this blessed Savior, since He cleansed and made me whole, since He cleansed and made me whole, I shall never cease. I shall never cease to praise Him. I'll shout. I'll shout. It won't be eternity. Come on, everybody, sing together. He touched me. He touched me. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Jesus touched me. Brother, God is touching you right now. Sister, God is touching you right now. The Lord is touching you, brother. Sister, the Lord is touching you. You can feel the power of God right now. You can feel God's anointing upon you. And now I know. And he touched me, Lord. He, he touched me. me. Thank you, Lord. Receive a touch. Yes, Receive a touch from Jesus God right now. Jesus touched me. And all the joy. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Fill your people with joy. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And now I know He touched me and made me whole. Oh, do you sing for the last time? He touched me. He touched me. We see what Christ touched from God. Yes, Jesus touched me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And all the joy that was my soul, Jesus, Some, something happened. Feel the wholesome presence of the Lord. I feel in my spirit that God's hand is touching some of you in a very special way. God's hand is touching you, brother. The hand of God is touching you in a way that you have not experienced before. The power of God is flowing. 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 God is touching you. God is touching you. Something happening right now. Something happening right now. Brother, something happening right now in you. Something happening right now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, God. 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 Think of Jacob that day. On that night at River Jabok, when Jacob was left all alone, God was with him. God was with him, but he was not blessed. God was with him, but not blessed. Jacob was asking God to bless him. Lord, I feel your presence. 
I know you are with me, but I am not blessed. I am not blessed. Bless me. Lord, bless me. You know what God said? What is your name? What is your name? Who are you? He said, I am Jacob, Lord. I am the cheat. I am the deceiver. I am a pretender. There God blessed him. Change him into Israel. A man who prevailed. God made him an overcomer. Change him into Israel. And the Bible says there God blessed him. Friend, you can come into the presence of God and still go away without blessing. But if you can acknowledge your true condition before God and say, Lord, this is my life. This is my condition. This is what I am. It's there God changes you and God begins to bless you. Take a decision today. Lord, if ever I come into your presence, I will never leave without your blessing. I will never leave without your blessing. I want to be blessed. I want my children to be blessed. I want my family to be blessed. Friend, take a decision this morning. Your life will be abundantly blessed. Thank you, Lord. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you this morning. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for ministering to hearts. Thank you, Lord, for speaking. Lord, it's true. We are sinking, Lord. Lord, in our spiritual life, we are sinking. We have gone away from you. We feel so low in our spiritual life. We want to cry unto you. And Lord, we want you to lift us up and make us to walk on the water victoriously over our situation, over our circumstance. And we know the wind in our life will cease. I pray may the Holy Spirit continue to speak to your people. Lord, I beseech you with all my heart that you will stretch forth your hand and bless your people this morning. We give you all the glory, honor and praise. In the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, the fellowship and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us this day. Till the Lord Jesus Christ come. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God be with you. Hope you have been blessed to the preaching of God's word today. Our Sunday church service timings are as follows. Our English service commences at 7 a.m. A Tamil service at 10.30 a.m. A Bible study, it's a bilingual service, commences at 6.30 p.m. Our church addresses Apostolic Christian Assembly, Perambur Ministries, 74 Balad Street, Agaram, Chennai 82. For personal prayer, kindly contact us at the following numbers. 95662622 Zero three or nine double five one six four eight zero eight three or double nine four one four four seven eight nine four. A church landline number is zero four four two six seven zero three six eight five. For more messages, visit our YouTube channel, ACA Permanent Ministries. Our church website is www acaparamaministries.org May God bless you.